Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. We're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders and municipal stakeholders from coast to coast to coast. Today on the show, we are going to be recapping the news from last week's Union of British Columbia Municipalities Conference in Vancouver. Then we turn to the Association of Manitoba Municipalities, who released their thoughts on the Manitoba provincial election and the party leaders' pledges to municipalities as part of the AMM's Let's Grow Manitoba Together campaign. Then we'll be sitting down with two councillors from Brooks, Alberta, who put forward a motion at this week's Alberta Municipalities Conference regarding leaving partisanship politics out of municipal campaigns in the province. We will also provide highlights of some of the Board of Director elections that will be taking place on Friday at the Alberta Municipalities Conference. And finally, the town of Coaldale announced that they will be hosting the 2024 Southern Alberta Summer Games in July. We chat with Coaldale Director of Recreation and Community Services, Russ Tanner, about the bid and what it means for the community. But first... In a landmark event marking its largest ever gathering, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities concluded its annual convention Friday by announcing the new table officers who will be leading the organization for the 2023-2024 term. With a focus on addressing pressing issues facing communities across the province, this newly elected team is poised to tackle the challenges that lie ahead. Councillor Tris Manduo of the City of Coquitlam has taken the helm as UBCM's president, receiving unanimous support from UBCM membership. Manduo, who served as the first vice president in the previous year, brings a wealth of experience and dedication to the role. I'd like to start by expressing my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for your incredible trust in confidence that you have placed in me by allowing me to take the helm as your president. Your trust is a tremendous honor and it means the world to me. I hope you can feel that. We can serve the people of British Columbia well when we walk side by side and step by step. In closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to all of you once again. I am excited and committed to serving in this role and working alongside such incredible colleagues and friends. Together, we will approach all the obstacles we are, face, we are facing and we will accomplish great things. She emphasizes the role of local governments in addressing challenges, stating the energy, the passion of our members throughout this past week is inspiring our executive team to strongly advocate on their behalf. If provided the powers, responsibility and tools necessary to face these challenges, local governments will deliver, end quote. The UBCM convention, which marked its largest ever gathering, provided a platform for local leaders to engage in constructive dialogue and forge collaborative solutions for the challenges confronting their communities. British Columbia Premier David Eby spoke at the week-long convention and gave hints at what lies ahead for municipalities in the province. In terms of uh, next phases and support, there are a number of different uh, uh, directions we're working on together in partnership with you. I uh, had a really uh, positive meeting with the uh, RBA folks uh, the, uh, the other morning. And the RBA, RBA people in the house. Uh, and uh, so uh, we've made some material progress on that. Uh, we uh, released a joint uh, report following our work there and that work continues. Uh, we're working with the federal government around their uh, what they call their Municipal Housing Accelerator Fund. Um, we had a bit of a struggle, frankly, uh, encouraging the federal government to connect uh, that fund with uh, the direct challenges uh, faced by communities around the infrastructure they need to get housing done. 
Uh, the new housing minister seems much more open to that discussion, and so we expect some good progress on that, and we're going to Ottawa shortly to press them for that. Uh, around uh, uh, critical trade infrastructure, which also has positive uh, impacts on, on local governments and communities around rail, transportation. Uh, it's a focus of the Western premiers and uh, premiers across Canada. We're uh, meeting with the federal government on that. That's also a direction that we're moving in. And then finally, around infrastructure for housing that you mentioned, Jen. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of municipalities and regional districts that have identified uh, a piece of infrastructure that would free up uh, lots for either residential or industrial uh, development uh, and would uh, both support you with an increased uh, tax base or relieve housing pressure. And so the Ministry of Housing is looking at ways with the Ministry of Finance of how we can support you on that uh, infrastructure to, to get the, those pieces moving in your communities. British Columbia United leader Kevin Falcon also spoke and said that he has heard many things, but overwhelmingly, it was about provincial policies. The overwhelming message that I've heard from delegates is they're very, very concerned about provincial government policies that are having really negative impacts on their respective communities. Um, their policies around housing people with severe untreated mental health and addiction issues and, and warehousing them, frankly, in motels in downtown communities without any proper supports has created chaos. I'm hearing about concerns around the, uh, the whole housing uh, piece. There's lots of communities that are ready to go with lots of housing, but the government's own bureaucracy gets in the way of actually getting dollars and, and results on the ground. And I think at the end of the day, you know, healthcare is always going to be a big piece that we hear from. Um, there are smaller communities, large communities, all of them are very, very concerned about what's happening in their emergency departments, the lack of access to healthcare, the fact we're sending people south to the United States for basic cancer care. A lot of concerns. Well, my thoughts are that it was a reckless decriminalization policy that the NDP introduced without any guardrails. And by guardrails, I mean making sure that we've got treatment options in place for people first, making sure there's an education element so that kids know that decriminalization does not mean legalization. We don't want kids to think that drugs are somehow safe or something they should be considering. Um, and, and the fact that there was no restrictions on open drug use, so that now we've got open drug use in parks and playgrounds, beaches, public spaces. That has really created a challenge in every community. And so we've been calling on the NDP for seven months. Please bring in a provincial law to just put the same restrictions, reasonable restrictions we put in place for drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or even using plastic straws in some cases. Just protect our kids and families. And they just refuse to do that except for teeny tiny steps that only deal with part of the problem. BC Green Party leader Sonia Furstenau was also in attendance at the 120th UBCM conference and said that she's hearing about the frustration municipal leaders are dealing with when speaking with cabinet ministers. So, so that's, I always find UBCM so inspiring in this way. And I said that in the speech, like the, the mission that people are on when they come here to serve their communities is just restores all my hope and faith. And on the flip side, I'm hearing more this year than I've heard in any year that I've been at UBCM, a level of frustration with the provincial government, with the fact that these solutions keep being brought forward and kind of left on the table. This is one of the reasons I'm making the case, like let's rethink a little bit how we are interacting between the province and local communities. And, and instead of once a year, these kind of frantic 15 minutes in front of a minister, how do we create an ongoing solutions-focused dialogue in communities that recognizes with the overlapping crises, the multiple challenges we're facing, we really do need to empower communities to be solution-oriented and that the provincial government needs to act more in a supportive way of the solutions that are being brought forward that make sense for different communities. At the conclusion of the week-long conference in Vancouver, the new team of table officers led by President Manduo will no doubtly work tirelessly to strengthen local government's ability to address the complex issues that impact British Columbia's across the province. They will no doubtly also be working hand-in-hand -hand with all provincial party leaders to ensure municipal issues are heard provincially. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most. 
in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Manitoba municipal leaders gathered in Brandon, Manitoba last week to give an update on their priorities for next Tuesday's provincial election and list what the province's three major parties have promised. Earlier this year, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities released a list of four major priorities it wanted the major parties to focus on during the provincial campaign. At the press conference, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities President Cam Blight said municipalities came together from all corners of the province to strategize about the key areas municipalities need to work with the next provincial government to grow the province together. We decided before the provincial election campaign got underway that we would discuss as a group all 137 municipalities, large and small, rural and urban, that we would, we would jointly identify our collective priorities for this year's provincial election. We did that, and collectively, we had a clear consensus on the needs that our municipalities feel to be the most pressing. We took these four priorities, these four pillars, and we built a campaign around them to make our message crystal clear so that all political parties would know exactly what our needs are. We launched our campaign in May. Even before our official launch, we had a soft launch and invited party leaders to a forum in April at our spring convention to discuss those very same four priorities. And as our mayors, reeves and councillors fanned out during the summer, we made sure that we left no stone unturned in speaking to our priorities so that not just party leaders, but all candidates running for seats in the Manitoba legislature would know what would be expected of them by our municipalities after the election. Blight outlined the four areas that the municipalities wanted the provincial leaders to focus on during the provincial campaign. What were those four priorities? Number one, fair and predictable municipal funding. To work with municipalities to establish a simplified, predictable funding model with an annual escalator. To rebate the PST paid by municipalities, similarly to the federal GST rebate. Number two, investing in core infrastructure. To increase Manitoba Water Services Board funding for water and wastewater infrastructure, and a commitment to permanent federal and provincial infrastructure fund. In relation to Bill 37, to enshrine the primacy of elected municipal councils over the unelected municipal board. To improve coordination between economic development offices and agencies. Why? To achieve efficiencies, synergies, and responsiveness to municipal economic development needs and comprehensive rural broadband and cell service, because it's time we recognize this as an essential infrastructure for economic growth, public safety, education, and healthcare. Number three, investing in people. We called on the province to accelerate a comprehensive provincial strategy to recruit healthcare professionals and paramedics throughout Manitoba. We called for the implementation of the recommendations from the Immigration Advisory Council to increase regional settlements incentives for foreign trained doctors and other professionals. We called for a plan for training opportunities for licensed professionals closer to home to avoid inter-regional brain drain of talent and over-concentration in our larger urban centers. And we called for care closer to home. A plan to keep paramedics, doctors, and other healthcare professionals working in all of our regions. Finally, number four, public safety. We sought commitments from all parties that they would press the federal government for bail and conditional release reform. That they would refuse downloading of policing reform costs 
that they would provide predictable police resourcing as well as flexibility to move certain enforcement and social service functions from police to separate provincially funded authorities to increase police funding to combat crime and drug, drug, drug trafficking and to expand the municipal community safety and well-being plans so all municipalities can benefit. He went on to add that municipalities do indeed have unique issues, but the four priorities laid out in the advocacy platform are the main areas that the municipalities see as needing to be addressed by the next provincial government. Well, as you can well imagine, when we spoke with all our municipalities uh, across the province of Manitoba, there is a countless number of major concerns that are impacting all municipalities. And we, I thought we did very well as AMM to narrow it down to four key pillars. And so these are the four main priorities that we feel are impacting municipalities, all municipalities across the province. And each and every one of them is uh, extremely critical. So I, we would not be able to single out one that's being more important than the other. Uh, all four of them are absolutely uh, integral, but they also all are connected together. While the focus of the press conference and the election was all about and has been about the provincial leaders and their priorities, Brandon Mayor Jeff Fawcett said the conversations were not only happening with party leaders, but also local candidates as well. And uh, absolutely, uh, you know, we're all working in the same uh, world. Uh, so discussions are always ongoing with all the candidates. Um, you know, they want to know the best interests are for our residents, they're their residents as well. So, uh, so everybody is trying to work together, doesn't matter what party they're with. We do have lots of uh, communication uh, with everyone. With Winnipeg being the capital and largest city of the province, Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham said that he hopes the next government comes to the table to help address the fiscal realities that municipalities are struggling with today. And uh, that's right, the AMM and, and my own comments did acknowledge the importance of, uh, of the lift the thaw to that funding freeze this year that really really helped uh, every one of our municipalities who have just been kind of trying to make do with costs going up and yet uh, provincial funding levels being capped for so long but you know standing with a group of leaders who are looking not only at uh, at the present and our present situation but we're also all projecting into the future and trying to imagine how do we secure and ensure we've got adequate funding for our municipalities to deliver services to our residents and, and that's going to necessitate a partnership with the province of Manitoba and a new funding formula that is, that is predictable. It is, um, really encourages municipalities to participate more so in, uh, in our, our local economies as well. And it grows with the economy. Um, the, the, the good news right now in our cities and communities is that things are growing. The population of our province is growing. People are living in, you know, all, all across, all across uh, Manitoba. Um, but we're also facing the cost pressures like everybody else is facing. Our labor costs are going up. Our costs on capital projects are going up. Uh, cities are also facing, you know, we put fuel in all our vehicles. Every, every resident across this province goes to the pump, you know, and, and the cost of gasoline and diesel is going up. So too the case with all of our vehicles in our municipalities. So we really need a mechanism and a formula with the provincial government that is uh, that, that grows with our economy and encourages us to, to uh, as, as municipalities to participate in that growth. Manitoba heads to the polls on Tuesday, October 3rd. And after the votes are counted, we will have reactions from municipal leaders from across the province of Manitoba. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. The Heron era of the Alberta municipalities will be coming to a close this week, with municipal leaders from all corners of the province set to descend upon Edmonton for the annual Trade and Convention Show. Kathy Heron, mayor of St. Albert, Alberta, has led the municipal organization in the province 
of Alberta for the last two years. Heron took over the position from Barry Morishita, who stepped down from the role in 2020 to become leader of the Alberta Party. With Heron's two-year term ending this week, three names have come forward as potential replacements for the president. Andre Chabot, the City of Calgary Councillor, Tyler Gandum, Wetaskiwin Mayor, and Trina Jones, Legal Mayor. Gandum currently serves on the Alberta Municipalities Board of Directors as cities up to 500,000, while Jones serves as Town's East Director. Chabot ran against Heron for Alberta Municipalities President in 2021. Running for the positions of Director of Cities up to 500,000 are Grand Prairie City Councillor Dylan Bressy, Red Deer City Councillor Lawrence Lee, Lethbridge City Councillor Belinda Croson, City of Spruce Grove Councillor Aaron Stevenson, and from the City of Airdrie, Councillor Tina Petro. Running for the position of Directors Town East are Mayor Carl Hotch of the town of Bruderheim and Mayor Trina Jones from the town of Legal. For the position of Directors Villages South, the candidates are Deputy Mayor Deborah Reed Mickler of the village of Duchess and Mayor Bruce McLeod from the village of Acme. Two positions were claimed on the 2023 Board of Directors. Mayor Tara Elwood from the Village of Alberta Beach will serve as Director Villages West. Mayor Ren Giesbreck, Mayor of the Summer Village of West Cove, will serve as Director of Summer Villages. The positions of Vice President, though, will be subjected to the results of the Directors and Presidential Elections. Two people are running for the position of Vice President, Villages and Summer Villages. Mayor Bruce McLeod of the Village of Acme and Deputy Mayor Deborah Reed Mickler of the Village of Duchess. Running for the position of Vice President of Towns are Mayor Trina Jones from the Town of Legal and Councillor Krista Gardine from the Town of Calmer. And also running for the position of Vice President Cities up to 500,000, Councillor Dylan Bressy from the City of Grand Prairie. The election results will be officialized on Friday this week, and we will be there at the Alberta Municipalities Conference covering this election live. As the 2023 Alberta Municipalities Trade and Conference Convention kicks off in Edmonton this week, one of the most hotly anticipated topics on the agenda is a proposed resolution that could reshape the landscape of municipal politics in the province. Sponsored by the city of Brooks, Alberta, and seconded by the village of Duchess, this resolution calls on the municipal organization to advocate to the provincial government for a clear separation of partisan politics from municipal elections. Local government officials are often considered the closest representatives to the people that they serve. They not only live within the communities they represent, but they also maintain regular interactions with their constituency, ensuring a high level of accountability and accessibility. Their ability to bring personal experience and what they believe in is for the best for their community into the decision-making process is seen as a cornerstone of efficient and accountable local government. Now, the proposed resolution argues that introducing partisan politics into municipal elections would be a disappointment, fundamentally altering the dynamics of local governance. Instead of voting based on the needs and desires of their communities, local elected officials would be pressured to align with ideology. So we caught up with Councillor Marissa Wardrop and Councillor Mohammed Idris of Brooks, Alberta, to discuss this resolution and why they see it as a necessity. Councillors, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Now, uh, the upcoming Alberta Municipal pa- Municipalities Conference in Edmonton is set to take place on Wednesday this week. Uh, as of recording, it will be in a week's time. Uh, I-, I want to talk about the motion that the City of Brooks has put forward and seconded by the village of Duchess, which is maintaining nonpartisan municipal elections in Alberta. Now, I, I want to get a brief sort of history lesson from the the two people who kind of know this resolution the best. 
Where did this resolution come from? And I, I'm going to just sort of do a, a random round table here. We'll start with uh, Councillor Idris, if possible, and then we'll uh, end with uh, Councillor Wardrop about how this resolution came about. Um, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to uh, talk about this resolution. It's, it's something that is... Uh important to us um and the history behind it is actually uh not 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 recent um we 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 have seen how politics in our country um have become a little bit uh, more partisan that we want uh, um this this goes back to the idea that politics is about serving people uh, and about serving the people on the ground that have that have elected you to go whether to sit in 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 a, in a in a council chamber or in the legislature or in 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 Ottawa, uh, the idea is that you are serving the people that you are serving. Uh, municipal elections have have been traditionally uh, nonpartisan, and and it has been a choice for us to to join these councils that we serve on. Uh, a choice to serve our communities, to serve um, our our people, and in in represent the best that we can find um, in in the work we do. So. Seeing, as I said, the, the 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 recent change in our political environments, in in political uh, debate, um, how how we are we are becoming more tribal, how we are becoming more um, ideological, um, we thought uh, we would like to safeguard this this last institution, the municipal election level, um, and, and and put those safeguards. Before anything happens, uh, we wanted this to 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 happen through legislation changes um, that will uh, put this as as a principle of 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 this of this uh, level of government that we work on. Now, uh, Councillor Wardrop, what about yourself? This this motion seems to be uh, uh, Alberta specific, but we are seeing some municipalities across Canada who do have partisan politics involved. Why is it important for uh, Alberta municipality members to vote for this resolution to keep municipal elections nonpartisan within the province of Alberta? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. I, I think that uh, Councillor just really addressed a lot of those points um, really well. Uh, it's it's so important for us to uh, to vote for this for this resolution because we need we need that strong advocacy we need uh anything that um undermines municipalities voices is a threat to uh democracy at this point you know we are concerned about um the divisiveness um that partisanship that hyper partisanship is bringing to um our province and our our country and across the world frankly um and this is part of um, our role as responsible and effective elected representatives. Ultimately, our job is to represent the people who who gave us the the honor and entrusted us to to be their voices. And we can't be um, our our people's voices if we are actually uh, trying to serve two masters here. If we're trying to um, tow a party line and and also speak. Um, with integrity and 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 honestly, just for our local residents, it it just isn't um, it just isn't feasible. Um, and and we see what happens. We're seeing what happens when when um, when elected uh, officials try to walk that line, and the work of government doesn't get done. Okay. Um, like actual, the actual work of government slows and it gets bogged down in, in a lot of nonsense and um, politics. And people are losing faith in their, in their, in their public institutions and their representatives. And, um, you know, local government is this last standing institution, kind of like um, Mohammed referenced, like, this is the beauty of what we have. We have we have nonpartisan local government where we are directly, um, we are so accessible and we are so ground level, um, uh, able to represent and advocate for the people on the ground who we, our votes directly, um, they affect their lives, like what we vote for. And um, in order to stay as, as true to, um, as true to that, uh, the the um, spirit and intent of that representation, then we need to be free to 
to make our, in, our decisions independently without the influence of political parties or a certain platform, um, regardless of, of you know, what's, what's, what place on the spectrum you're at. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not good for people. It's not good for communities. Are you hearing from other municipal leaders from across Alberta on this issue? Now, I know you're going to be heading into the Alberta Municipalities Conference in a few days here, but you don't just bring forward a resolution with it with, like this without some engagement from other municipal leaders. Now, I know this, the Village of Duchess has seconded the motion, but are you talking with other counterparts throughout the province to gauge their reaction on if they see as, uh, like you do, that partisan politics needs to stay out? side of the municipal realm. Uh, I'm going to, I started with Councillor Idris last time, I'm going to start with Councillor Wardrop on this one. Um, yeah, you know, this, this, there have been conversations, there have been um, discussions happening, um, you know, in, in, in recent times in last year. Uh, and, and it does come up in conversations with um, municipal, with our municipal counterparts. Um, it is something that a lot of us are, I don't want to say fearful of, but very concerned about, um, because like I said before, it does, it, um, number one, it does undermine, it has the potential, sorry, to undermine um, local voices and, and undermine our advocacy for our local communities. And uh, it, it does, um, it, it restricts our ability to do our job. And the thing is, is that we've all, we are. We, we've people who um, who who are elected representatives in municipalities. We made a very intentional choice to serve local local communities, and part of that is the uniqueness um, that local government has, and that we don't have political parties. We don't have to align ourselves with an ideology to serve our communities, and so to take that away uh, from us. Um, is concerning to every municipal leader I've spoken to. Councilor Idris, what about yourself? Are you speaking with municipal leaders from across Alberta? And what are they telling you about this issue, if you have heard from their concerns or even their issues with partisan politics entering into the municipal realm? Um, thank you. Um, I, I do. I, I, I'm talking to several people, and I'm actually I have the privilege of sitting on on an AUMA um, or Alberta Munis uh, committee, um, where where I meet with um, elected officials from several committees around around the province, um, and I have also had the the the, the privilege of attending uh, some of the sessions around the president summits and things like that 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 happened, um, and actually I I go back even to conversations I had. Um, at the last convention in Calgary, um, in, in in some of the concerns that we are talking about now, uh, the concerns that uh, we are becoming so divisive in our politics that that it's very difficult to work with someone across the across the floor. Um, actually, one point that that came multiple times when I talked to to people is this intergovernmental relationship. And the dysfunction that happens in the provincial and federal level uh, now, because for example, we have uh, a right-leaning government in our in our province with versus a left-leaning government in 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 the federal government, they are not able to do a lot of things for the people that elected them. Uh, imagine if we bring that into the municipal level. Imagine that uh, we get elected, whether left or right-leaning council, and then there is uh, an opposite government in Edmonton. Um, what is the relationship is going to look like? What is uh, the amount of outcomes that we are going to bring to our people? So councils that I'm talking with, whether, whether in convention or whether in committees that I sit on, talk about that because these are factual thing that could happen. Now, that's a good jumping off point here, because I want to talk about the partisanship that may be uh, perceived with this emotion. This motion isn't set up to be against one party or another, correct? Because uh, you both know, uh, I'm assuming, that uh, in October of 2022, then Premier, just newly elected from the United Conservative Party, Danielle Smith, uh, opened the door to some cities in the province to get municipal political parties, including Calgary and Edmonton. Now, I, I just want to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence here. This isn't just 
saying that we don't want partisan politics because it's right or left. You're just saying you just don't want any interference from the political parties uh, from whether what ideology you come from, correct? Who wants to take that? I can start. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, um, so so definitely you are hundred percent correct. And and actually to add to your your comments, um, we know that this idea has been floating around and was floated by several parties, not only um, the the specific party in in, in government. Now, um, in in the last election, in the last provincial election, we heard it from different leaders, from different. Uh, 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 politicians. And, and we continue to hear that. We continue to hear that there are some conversations going on. There are some conversations that is happening as we speak, maybe. Um, so this is not about any of these. This is about that that foundational uh, principle value that we see in provincial government, in municipal government, sorry. Uh, we see this as that 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 institution that is the closest to the people, that uh, has the, the 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 most impact on the day to day lives of the people of Alberta, um, and we think that institution has to remain uh, non partisan. Councilor Wardrop. Um, yeah, let me just say this about this this subject. Um, we it, it's undeniable that we all have our biases. Um, this isn't about me trying to tell you that I am bias free. That's not that's not true. Okay, we all have a, have our biases, and and um, when we're elect, elected to council, we all come to the table with with our histories and with our own political um, baggage and ideology and and um, anyway our own stuff, uh, but we check that baggage at the door. That's part of the job. We come to the table and we are a diverse group of people, but we come to collaborate and we challenge each other. We have good debates, but we have a common purpose. And if we bring partisanship into it, um, the common purpose could get lost, right? And I feel like it, that's a very, 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 it's, it's inevitable actually, that our common purpose of service to our communities gets lost all in that in the partisanship. Um, because right now uh, we have a system that that works, right? We, um, you know, it's not perfect, but adding adding partisanship uh, will really take away from our ability to do our jobs and to serve with integrity, to vote with our conscience, to vote um, with whatever we feel is right. Um, you know, uh, just having a conversation about our, this resolution the other day, um, myself, uh, Councillor Idris, and a couple others. Uh, we we're talking about how great it is, the freedom to change your mind, you know, the, the freedom to debate each other without expectation of, oh, well, I know what uh, Marissa is going to say over here because she's over, you know, that's, that's not, uh, that's not our reality. That's not the experience that we live in. And that is, that's why local government is the most representative form of democracy right now in Canada is it works like that. We are all committed. We have that common purpose, and we check our we check our biases at the door. We can't pretend that we don't have them, but we we talk it through and we make decisions for the best of everyone in our communities. Now I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with both of you here for a second because you both know uh, that while traditionally municipal politics is nonpartisan. There are some communities in this country that are politically aligned with partisan politics. Talk about Vancouver, talk about Victoria, talk about Surrey, talk about Montreal. Now, it's not unheard about to see partisan politics enter into the municipal realm. Have you spoken with or have you observed how partisan politics has changed the way municipal government is sort of dealt with in those communities, and I'm not saying pick and choose which one you're looking at, but have you observed how partisan politics has changed the way that municipal governments have run? And do you see a concern with it entering? You talk about, uh, Councillor Wardrop, that uh, you're going to be aligned to one party or another. You're going to be entrenched in the way that you think. Uh, do you see that in other municipalities who do have the partisan politics already? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think... Part of our concern is that we do see this partisan hyper partisanship, this this creep into society in general, and we can't um, separate society from each individual municipality. So absolutely, there 
um, just in Alberta, right? We we see like we can't ignore certain trends, right? Um, some communities as a whole lean one way or the other. Um, so far, from my experience, um, just like locally, like in Southern Alberta, I haven't personally seen um, that changing how government works at this point. But that is the concern: is that um, we need to we need to stop this now. We need to be proactive before it does potentially affect how government works. Um, because I don't know, and 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 counselor just can take this after me, but um, I, I think that's the concern, you know, is we see this creeping into um, not just provincial, um, federal uh, levels of government, but just how we interact with each other as individuals, right? Um, and, and it's not a far cry, it's not a far stretch to say that this, you know, this could threaten the, um, the independence and, and the the nonpartisanship of how local government works. Council Idris, I, I want to ask a, a very poignant question right now. And again, it goes on the lines of playing devil's advocate with you for a bit, bit here, but there might be people who say, well, you may not want partisan politics in our municipal government, but it's already there. We are seeing in the last municipal elections, particularly in the larger urban centers, a uh, slate of candidates, whether it be for a union, whether it be for a certain third party uh, uh, a political action committee already there. So why not just raise up the uh, lower the walls and actually let partisan politics enter into the political realm? Because most people assume it's already there. It's just not in name. You know, we, we, we actually had this discussion when we were discussing this this resolution. What are we trying to uh, uh, control? What are we trying to uh, uh, guide? And, and, and it, it's, it's a couple of things that came to mind. It's actually the money, uh, the, the, the uh, association from, from some sort of like, a, um, what did we call it? We, we talked about the money and we talked about... Um, I think I will need to go back. I think we said money. Uh, 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 lobbying, endorsements. Lobbying, endorsements. So money, like, the, like the money, the endorsement. So, so, so what we are trying to control are those very clear, very open things that political parties can bring into municipal election. Um, we, we want people to be elected because people think... They can deliver, not because there is a budget of $100,000 behind their names, okay? We want people to be elected because people in their communities believe that they can do what they said they will do, not because some leader told people that this is who I want you to elect. So, so what we are trying to control are those factors that will impact people's vote, will impact people's uh, belief, will impact people's trust in, in the person that they are electing. Um, Council Wardrop talked about the fact that we all have our own biases. At the end of the day, we are politicians. We we are not we are not people who don't have interest in politics. Uh, but but that 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 sense it that that uh, that uh, like what you do when you go behind that curtain and vote for a, for a party is your own thing. That is why we keep it. That's why we keep it something that we we respect and 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 we keep it that way um, so it's not about it's not about saying there are no politics in in municipal election there are politics we are politicians but we are trying to control these factors that influence and impact people's vote and people's trust in the people they elect to these uh, council chambers and, and mainly it is it is the money that can influence sometimes more than the the, the, the actual uh, uh, council candidate uh, or the, the the name behind or the name of the party behind their names. So I'm going to end on this question, and I think it's the most important one, because you are elected to represent the people of your community. You're there to represent the people who have voted for you and the people who have not. What are the people of Brooks, Alberta, the cities that you both represent, 
telling you about this issue? Are they saying we are we have concerns about partisan politics actually entering into the political arena? Or are they not even talking about this issue? I just want to make sure that people know that this isn't just two councillors or a city coming up with this idea and running with it. This is coming from the people because grassroots is always important. So uh, I, 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 I think I started with uh, Councillor uh, Wardrop last time. So I'm going to start with Councillor Idris here and end with Councillor Wardrop. Uh, definitely, people are not happy with what's happening. Um, go to Facebook, go to uh, community forums, go to uh, town halls. Uh, everything people talk about is how dysfunctional our governments are and how um, untrustworthy in, in how um, they take care about their bosses as as uh, Councillor Wardrobe mentioned the idea of the two masters. Uh, they took care of their masters before they take care of us, the people on the streets. And, 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 and that is why we are bringing this up. It's not something that um, we believe in it, but it's not something that uh, we are doing just for uh, a personal uh, cause or a personal agenda. It is something that we are hearing from people. And I think uh, anybody that says something else is not talking to the people. Councilor Wardrop? Yeah, um, I, it is It is about being the, the last offense almost. We are, we're here because we, we care and we, as good stewards of our community, it's our job. Like I feel a responsibility to, to protect my community and to insulate not just my community, but municipalities in general um, I, I, against this, this partisanship that seems to be dividing us and yeah, just making us in, you know, more tribal. Um, it is, it's discouraging and um, it, it does erode a lot of uh, public faith in us as representatives and just the, you know, government as a public institution. And um, yeah, you don't have to look very far or uh, to, to, to just even sense the dissatisfaction that, um, that people have right now, the loss of faith that people have um, about you know, why, why levels of government are making this choice and, and exactly what are their intentions? Where's the money trail? What, is, what are they really doing, right? What are they saying behind closed doors? Um, you know, and we're, we're not to be dramatic, <laughs> it sound dramatic, but you know, we're trying to be, we are the last one standing here that just has a, has a sense of like, what's this really about? We've got our eye on the big picture. And that, those are the real issues in local government. And right now we do, we have that freedom. We have that independence. We get to vote with our, with our conscience and, and debate open-mindedly without a party whip kind of breathing down our necks. Um, and I, I would, I'd be shocked if you could find a, a resident, not just of Brooks, but anywhere in the province or the country for that matter, that I would say they'd prefer, prefer something different. I think that's really yep. what we ultimately want from our elected officials. Now, if you know me, you know that I, when I say it's my last question, I, what I really mean, it's actually my second last question because I come up with a question <laughs> right after you guys talk. And I, I just want to know, because ultimately this decision comes down to the provincial government. This decision is going to be made, passed by the provincial government. Now, have you either of you or even the city of Brooks in, as, a, as a whole had conversations with uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rick McIver, or the previous Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rebecca Schultz. And I'm going to even go one further here because I think it's important to just clarify for those who are listening, maybe outside of the province of Alberta, but even your yeah. local MLA, who just happens to be the Premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith. So have you had conversations with anyone within the provincial government to make sure that they understand where your views are on on this issue who wants to take Not the last question <laughs> i'll start and then mohammed can can tie up the loose ends this anything that i forgot he's you're always good at that <laughs> um so not at this point we haven't had these face-to-face -face discussions yet um but as you know next week we will all be there together and uh we are very much planning on uh speaking with uh our minister of municipal affairs uh, we haven't spoken about this with uh, Rebecca Schultz, the previous minister, um, but the, uh, I think the converse, this conversation isn't just happening uh, between 
us on our, our local council and with Duchess, this is a conversation that's happening uh, amongst all municipalities. Um, the conversation is is happening. Um, and I, I believe that um, ministers and uh, our MLA, the Premier, have already get the sense of where our municipalities are leaning on this on this issue um, and they will I feel they will um, hear from us uh, whether it'll be on the res resolution floor or maybe in the bear pit there um, or just in our meetings our one-on-ones and our conversations last word yes. to you Councillor Idris <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I think Marisa said it well. Um, uh, it's it's our opportunity next week to to speak to uh, many of our elected officials that we are going to meet with and, 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 and talk to. But also I want to bring up the fact that this is actually not something new. This is the policy of the Alberta Municipalities uh, Organization. Uh, when I think they have a policy on uh, local elections. Um, and in their policy, it says that their, their position is that uh, municipal elections uh, should remain nonpartisan. Um, so this has been uh, uh, communicated with the provincial governments in, in, in different um, opportunities that they had and, and other people have. And as Marisa said, uh, I believe the province have heard this from different people and they will hear it from us again next week. Awesome. Councillors, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to sit down and chat with me. Um, as always, I look forward to seeing you guys in person at the Alberta Municipalities Conference, where we will be there covering it for the three full days. I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing you guys in person again. Thanks. Looking forward to it, too. Thank you, Chris. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. The town of Coaldale, Alberta is abuzz with excitement as it has proudly announced that it has been chosen to host the highly anticipated 2024 Southern Alberta Summer Games. In a long-awaited return to normalcy, this announcement comes as a ray of hope after the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Southern Alberta Summer Games, which has been a cherished tradition for over a half a century, face disruptions and cancellations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the 2024 games are set to be the first since 2019 that will offer a full range of programming, marking a significant step towards returning to pre-pandemic normalcy. Russ Tanner, the Director of Recreation and Community Services for Coaldale, Alberta, shared his enthusiasm and insights about this prestigious hosting opportunity in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with us. Russ, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, so the big news that came out Friday morning, Coaldale has been selected as the host city for the 2024 Southern Alberta Games. Uh, you, you guys must be happy because I know this has been something in the works for some time now. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for uh, taking the time with us. And uh, and yeah, we're really excited because prior to 2019, the Southern Alberta Summer Games were the longest running games in Western Canada. And it's a tradition that everybody in South, Southern Alberta used to mark, well, most people in Southern Alberta used to mark their calendars and know when it was. And uh, many people that grew up uh, in these regions uh, participated, whether it was in swimming, athletics, basketball, beach volleyball, cribbage. I mean, that's the other thing is these games also encompass like every age group, right? Like it's grassroots from uh, right from kids right up to seniors. And uh, we're pretty excited to be able to be the community that's helping bring them back to Southern Alberta. Uh, we have a new multi-purpose recreation facility. It's going to be attached to the new high school here in Coldell. Uh, that's going to be open just before, so it's going to be shiny and new. We're going to be able to showcase that. Uh, and uh, lots is happening here in Coldell. We just want to bring uh, the south region in here and, uh, and uh, have a big party. 
what better party than the Southern or Southern Alberta Summer Games? So, yeah. Exactly. You talk about how Coldale's growing, and it is. I just had the pleasure of uh, recently touring uh, the community earlier this summer with your mayor and one of your councillors. And then I got to know, uh, has this always been something that's been on the radar for Coldale to try to host? Or is this something that's just come up recently with the sort of the new advancements and the new rec facility, as you mentioned? How did this idea get a spark for the town to say it would be something that we'd be interested and let's see if we could and let's see if we would have community buy in? Yeah, well, the timing's right for sure for Coldale, as like you you, you pointed out, we're growing and there's a lot happening here. But um, you know, when and the way the Southern Alberta Summer Games happen is 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 the communities in Southern Alberta can can put in a proposal, uh, they can show interest that they want to host the games, and like I said, prior to 2019, it it happened every single year, and oftentimes we had communities you know bidding against each other to host the games because. The economic spinoff it brings in a community, right? You're looking at uh, 2,000 plus participants, almost the same amount of participants that happen in the Alberta games. But in these games, these are grassroots. So they're bringing with them. We're not housing the athletes, but what we do is we bring with them their families, their sisters, their brothers, everybody. And oftentimes you're looking at campgrounds, you're looking at hotels, you know, everything. So uh, food establishments, gas stations, everybody gets to, to the spinoff of this. So, so there is you know, certainly a benefit to the town of Coldale as a whole doing this. But at the same time, many of us grew up participating in these games and uh, we just want to see them back. And so, uh, so yes, Coldale is going to step up and, uh, and, uh, and be a, a big part of why they came back and put on a big party. So this is a big undertaking because the host of a, a or an event like this does doesn't just take administration, but it takes volunteers. I know you are putting out a call for volunteers to help out, but what uh, what should the people of Coldale or even the outside of the city of uh, the town of Coldale be looking for to potentially help out and give uh, uh, the Coldale a leg up in hosting these uh, ceremonies? Because if I'm not mistaken, they are the 51st annual uh, Alberta uh, Southern Alberta summer event. So what how can people get involved and what do the people of uh, Coldale need to do to help out and make sure that these games are a success, not only for them, but to continue this legacy of having the 52nd and 53rd. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks Chris for bringing the volunteerism up as well, because it does, it takes a whole bunch of people to put these games on. We uh, are looking for people to champion um, what, you know, sports and activities they really have a passion for to be able to run. Uh, there are some core sports that we go after and we need to do like athletics and, and swimming and soccer and all those things. But, but we're, we're also given some leeway on what other events to, to take place. And so we will be reaching out to some people in many situations, like organizations that, that currently exist uh, that uh, look after lacrosse, like whether it's Lethbridge Lacrosse that also operates out here in Coldale and things like that. So we'll reach out to organizations like that to be able to see if they will jump on board and run a tournament type of thing, right, within the games. But uh, we also will be looking for people that if, if there's a sport or a event like cribbage or uh, mountain biking, right, we uh, we built a brand new mountain bike park here in Coldale. And so mountain biking isn't, isn't something that I even remember ever seeing in the games, but it is something we can put in. So we'll be looking for volunteers for those things. Also volunteers for, we're going to, be doing some entertainment whether it's the opening ceremonies closing ceremonies during the games and things like that we uh, we're going to be doing some entertainment so we're going to need some people to jump on board and, and, and help us with with some of that uh, and so uh, we, we will be sending out uh, even more information in the coming weeks as to how uh, that looks uh, but by all means if people are interested already and are excited about this they can contact us now, this this is still early days, and I apologize for asking this type of question, but um, what does the town do now? Because now you've been selected as the host. You've been accepted to host these uh, games in July of 2024. Um, is this going to be a town-driven event, or is it going to be a community-driven event? So will you be having a board to sit down and make sure that everything's on uh, pace, or is it going to be mostly uh, driven by the town to ensure that it does actually get up and running and it goes off without a hitch? 
will be it will be a combination, but certainly the town is providing the support needed to get there to the finish line. However, we will be establishing a board for sure. There will be a games chairperson, and there will be a chairperson for each um, event within that. There will be, uh, and so we we will actually sit down and start working on what that looks like now. Like I said, reaching out to people to find out which events we can actually host here in the area. Uh, and then um, we will be hiring a games coordinator. Uh, so the town will take on that uh, that fee and that uh, that cost to hire a games coordinator uh, to start in January and work, work right through to the games to kind of oversee and just make sure the business side of things are all looked after. Uh, but our community services department who, uh, you know, we've got uh, a plethora of, uh, of, of talent within our community services department. And so we ten have tons of resources. We will continue to be involved with those meetings, to be involved as support and moving this forward for sure. So there's a lot to do, and I've got to ask the million dollar question: Is Coldale up for the challenge to make sure that these uh these these games go off and make sure that they are as successful as you hope they are when you originally pitched the idea? We are definitely up for the challenge. Uh, coming from a person that's hosted a couple times in other communities, Coldale is ready, and I'm even going to take it a step further and say we're ready to be the best yet. Perfect. Russ, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to sit down and do this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. In a series of close-watched by-elections held across the province of Alberta last week, several notable victories and changes in local leadership were observed. Among the notable results was Brad Schlossberger was elected as the next mayor of the town of Clare's Home, Alberta, in a closely contested election. The town of Clare's Home saw a remarkable turnout with 945 residents participating in the by-election to determine their new mayor. Schlossberger emerged as a clear victor, amassing an impressive 569 votes, thereby securing his position as the new mayor of the community. His closest rival, Lon Hall, received 376 votes. With Schlossberger stepping into the role as mayor, his previous council seat will now be occupied by Diana P. Ross, Ross faced stiff competition from four other challengers. In another notable result last week, Ray Gibson achieved a resounding victory in the village of Britain Lakes by-election, defeating his sole challenger, Marilyn Deese, by a commanding margin of 55 votes to 32 votes. Meanwhile, in the municipal district of Bighorn, Alberta, Ward 1, Steve Fitzmorris emerged as the triumphant candidate in the by-election. Fitzmorris secured an impressive 99 votes, surpassing his only competitor, Robin Bushlack, who received only 55 votes. And lastly, last week, in a pivotal by-election held Thursday, the village of Carbon underwent a significant transformation in its council makeup. Three new councillors, Travis Cormier, Rosalie Jimmo and Marie Kuman emerged victorious among a pool of six candidates competing for the three open council seats. These by-elections have provided residents of Alberta's various municipalities with new leaders and fresh perspectives, highlighting the importance of civic engagement and the democratic process at the grassroots level. Now, as September turns into October, municipalities from across Alberta and Saskatchewan will be gearing up for more municipal by-elections, including the summer village of Norglenwood on September 30th, the town of Leroy, Saskatchewan will be heading to the polls on October 4th, Birch Hills County, Alberta goes to the polls on October 16th, a day later, the village of Beesaker goes to the polls on the 17th. And the town of Nipawin, Saskatchewan, heads to the polls on October 18th to elect a new mayor. And finally, to just recap, the city of Beaumont, Alberta, will be heading to the polls to elect two new councillors on October 23rd. For the latest updates on all the by-election results, visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. And that's all for this Monday, September 25th edition of the Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. We'd like to extend a heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched and listened to this episode. 
Your support means the world to us. Now remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please keep those stories coming in. Share your municipal news, concerns, and even triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter to our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking. Thank you.